In 1776, this noble document proclaimed a new era in man's eternal struggle for freedom, declaring that all men have the God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was to secure the protection of these God-given rights that our founding fathers, men of wisdom and foresight, established these United States of America as a limited constitutional republic. A system of law and order to protect every man's rights was thus firmly established. And the story of America's expansion westward unfolded only as rapidly as the protection for these rights could be extended. In these early days of the settling of new areas, there was no problem of public apathy. For the pioneers who pushed westward enjoyed these God-given rights to life, liberty, and property only when they were willing and able to protect them. The protection they afforded themselves and their families was direct, but not always adequate. So, with the establishing of frontier towns, came the era of the legendary frontier lawmen, such as Wyatt Earp, Wild Bill Hickok, Pat Garrett, and many others. Men who forever left their mark on history. But man's enjoyment of his God-given right to life, liberty, and property became a reality in the West only after an orderly society was established. Today, in America, it is the local law enforcement agencies established, maintained, and controlled at the community level, which provide the bulwark of protection for our rights and property. The men and women who make up our local police forces are hand-picked and carefully screened, the best trained, most qualified people available. They are respected and trusted by the law-abiding citizen, for he knows that they are also his neighbors and fellow citizens, dedicated to this oath which demands the extraordinary. History shows that when respect for law and order breaks down, the stability and safety of the entire civilization is in peril. And today, many Americans are speaking out and showing their concern, for they are genuinely alarmed with the turn of events in recent years. While Americans were enjoying even greater material abundance than ever before, the crime rate in America just since 1960 increased by 47% six times the rate of our national population growth. The number of murders, rapes, robberies, and assaults increased at a shocking rate, and a sober, serious look at the statistics gives support to warnings such as this. There is a national crisis in crime. This country is in real trouble. And this, crime looms as a clear and present danger to the existence of organized society. This orgy of lawlessness is visible to anyone. Our daily newspaper headlines tell of the mounting wave of crime and rioting that is sweeping across the land. In the Watts area of Los Angeles, 13,900 National Guardsmen, 934 policemen, and 719 sheriff's officers were required to put an end to those bloody riotous days and nights in August 1965. During a brief 20-day period in July 1966, Cleveland was under a virtual state of siege as looters, arsonists, and snipers battled local police with four persons killed and 46 injured. Chicago experienced three terror-filled days and nights of bloody rioting that ended in two deaths and 60 persons injured. Outbreaks of violence and rioting also occurred in San Francisco, Jacksonville, Florida, New York City, South Bend, Indiana, Philadelphia, Des Moines, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska, and many other cities. Senseless violence and civil disobedience running rampant as hoodlums and punks prowled streets, alleys, and parks, making the streets of most American cities unsafe for the law-abiding citizen. American youths, misled and confused by an obey-only-the-laws-you-like philosophy, break the law just for kicks and further fan these flames of turmoil manning the front lines of defense against this tide of lawlessness is the local law enforcement officer entrusted with the responsibility of protecting life and property in addition to the normal hazards of his chosen profession 
he today finds himself under constant criticism and severely handicapped. For in case after case, the courts are imposing crippling restrictions on law enforcement agencies, in effect tying the hands of the police. This in the face of a runaway crime rate. As in the Escobedo case, court rulings have forced the release on mere technicalities of criminals who have confessed their guilt. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, recently said, quote, There is too much concern in this country for the rights of an individual who commits a crime. I think he is entitled to his legal rights, but I think the citizens of this country ought to be able to walk all the streets of our cities without being mugged, raped, or robbed, end quote. He concluded that this is impossible today. When Orlando W. Wilson, Chicago superintendent of police, was asked, are court rulings handicapping police seriously in enforcing the law? He answered, in my judgment, yes. It has become almost safer to be a criminal than a law-abiding citizen, due in part to the court's search for error rather than justice. A spirit of lawlessness and contempt for law is the growing result and this lawless spirit seems to be spreading. What is happening? Is this outbreak of lawlessness planned? More Americans are demanding to know, and those who care enough to look are finding some disturbing answers. In Cleveland, Ohio, the grand jury investigating the recent siege of destruction in their city concluded that the violence was organized and exploited by trained and disciplined professionals, aided by misguided people, many of whom are avowed believers in violence and extremism, and some of whom are either members of or officers in the Communist Party. Congressman William Kramer of Florida stated that the evidence clearly shows this violence is the work in part of well-trained outside agitators who come into these communities for the express purpose of inciting violent civil disobedience. Los Angeles Mayor Sam Yorty claims that communists were instrumental in igniting the bloody 1965 Watts riots. He also issued this warning. We face urban guerrilla warfare, an absolute plan to burn and sack the city. Mayor Yorty's warning was substantiated by Michael Lasky, an admitted member of and spokesman for the Communist Party in the Los Angeles area. This notorious radical blatantly boasted to his followers the party is presently engaged in the formation of people's armed defense groups in the Watts District of Los Angeles. We have been operating and agitating openly in Watts for the past three years. William Epton, an organizer and spokesman for the Red Chinese-oriented Progressive Labor Party, shouted forth this threat just hours before the 1965 Harlem riots began. We must smash this state completely and totally. We're going to have to kill a lot of these cops, a lot of these judges. We'll organize our own militia and our own army. Detailed instructions on how to make and use gasoline firebombs, Molotov cocktails against the police, are given in a pamphlet distributed by the 1,200-strong radical group known as the Revolutionary Action Movement. Stokely Carmichael, chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, has added to these exhortations to violence with statements such as, This is the richest country in the world, and Negroes want to share in the wealth. And the feeling is that if Negroes cannot enjoy part of that dream, they're going to burn the country down. Hardy Fry, a Carmichael Field Secretary, warned, I don't know the Lord's Prayer anymore. I've got me a new prayer now and it shoots six shots. Even the chairman of the New York City Commission on Human Rights, William Booth, with these words, if the people aren't getting what they need, they should go out and take it, has joined in the cry for violence. Allowing rabble-rousers such as Booth, Fry, Carmichael, Epton, and Lasky the right to make inflammatory statements is the price that Americans willingly pay to preserve freedom of speech. But many Americans are concerned over the inflammatory statements being made by some of our national leaders in politics, in civil rights, and in religion that seem to have added fuel to this lawless mood that is sweeping across the land. President Lyndon Johnson, in language usually used by the Castros, 
Khrushchevs and Mao Zedongs, told a group of students, I am proud this morning to salute you as fellow revolutionaries. To ensure that his words were properly interpreted, he added, I hope that you will go out into the hinterland and rouse the masses and blow the bugles and tell them that the hour has arrived and their day is here, that we are on the march against the ancient enemies and we are going to be successful. The Vice President of the United States, Hubert Humphrey, when recently asked what he would do if he lived in the slums, answered, I think you'd have more trouble than you have had already because I've got enough spark left in me to lead a mighty good revolt. The late Adlai E. Stevenson, during a commencement address at Colby College in 1964, actually praised the students' participation in this spirit of lawlessness with these words. Even a jail sentence is no longer a dishonor, but a proud achievement. While we find some clergymen in the sit-ins, the lay-ins, and the marches taking part in what they call religious activism, many others are preaching disrespect for the law from their pulpits and encouraging the attacks on law and order throughout their communities. The January 23, 1967 issue of U.S. News and World Report revealed that, quote, on January 9th, it was announced in New York that Roman Catholic and Protestant clergymen had invited Saul D. Alinsky, self-styled professional radical, to help organize slum dwellers for rent strikes, picketing, sit-ins, and political agitation as he has in Chicago, Rochester, Detroit, and other big cities at the behest of religious leaders. End quote. Charles E. Whitaker, for five years a U.S. Supreme Court justice, sounded this alarm to all who value their God-given rights to life, liberty, and property. The pattern of forcing demands by mass or mob actions outside the law and the courts has proved, as certainly we should have expected, to be tailor-made for infiltration, use, and takeover by rabble-rousers and communists who are avowedly bent on the breakdown of law, order, and morality of our society, and hence on its destruction. The documentary film, Berkeley Revolution, showed that many of America's college youth have been infected with this attitude of disrespect for law and order and the property of others, for this plague of lawlessness seems to have invaded many of our nation's college campuses. Most Americans are shocked to learn the depth and extent of this penetration, and even the most knowledgeable Americans were amazed to discover the University of California at Davis is now giving academic credit for a course which invites students to observe or join in marches and demonstrations. Dr. Max Rafferty, California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, speaking out about the shocking and disgusting activities occurring on the university campus at Berkeley said, demonstrations there provided a vehicle for infiltration by rabble-rousers, red-hots, and communists, and resulted in assaults kidnappings and imprisonment of police officers, the commandeering of public address systems, and their use in spewing over the campus the most filthy four-letter words, and the general breakdown of law and order. Such activities are becoming increasingly widespread. In the May 10, 1965 issue of U.S. News and World Report, Dr. James M. Nabrit, president of Howard University, the scene of recent campus turmoil, reported that he had seen known communists passing out pamphlets and helping to deliver placards to pickets on and about his campus. Even the normally scholarly atmosphere at the University of Wisconsin has been shattered. An Associated Press report noted that just prior to a siege of campus demonstrations, a student leader at the University of Wisconsin had openly urged that, quote, the students should band together to bring down the government by any means, end quote. The rise in lawlessness is not surprising, for when leaders and rabble-rousers alike issue continuing preachments to defy the law, surely lawlessness must follow. Amazing as it may seem, we not only tolerate this lawlessness, but have encouraged it by honoring some of the so-called leaders who advocate obeying only the laws we like. Martin Luther King is the most blatant example of this. His nonviolent movement seems to breed violence wherever he goes but the Nobel Committee awarded him its highest prize for, of all things, 
his contributions to peace. Another is Robert F. Kennedy, Senator from New York. Commenting on the Watts riots, he said in effect, there is no point in telling Negroes to obey the law when many of them feel the law is their enemy. Such irresponsible statements must inevitably lead some people into conflict with the police. And the cry of police brutality seems to always rise from these clashes between the lawless and the law. The late Chief William F. Parker called this cry of police brutality a vicious canard to cover lawless activities and part of an attempt to try and find someone else to blame for their crimes. Chief Parker warned, if the American people continue to buy this canard, they are going to lose their security. Our international enemies won't have to worry. We will defeat ourselves internally. With the cry of police brutality being heard so often, we might ask, just what is police brutality? When does state and federal law recognize police brutality? Simply, whenever unnecessary and excessive force is used by a police officer, for unnecessary force is punishment, a right reserved by the courts. In every large city, police files bulge with charges of brutality. Where no force of any kind was used, the agitators claim verbal brutality, which usually means stern language or hard stares by policemen. In many of these cases, those complaining about verbal brutality do not object to what the police officer said, it is the way he said it. Common are brutality charges by sit-in and lay-down demonstrators who say they were not hauled away gracefully enough. Charges of police brutality are shouted regularly from street corners during demonstrations. For here is where they can be used to arouse gullible citizens without having to face investigation. Atlanta Police Chief Herbert T. Jenkins pointed out, The charge of police brutality is as old as law enforcement. A prisoner's best defense often is to accuse the arresting officer of brutality. Between mid-1964 and mid-1965, 1,700 police brutality complaints were examined by the Federal Bureau of Investigation but their investigation revealed that the police officer was convicted of the alleged misconduct in only five cases. Although only a small percentage of the police brutality charges are legally valid, even the unfounded charges are very serious. This feature article in the September 6, 1965 issue of U.S. News & World Report disclosed that Charles E. Moore, an official of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, had testified before the U.S. Senate Internal Security Subcommittee that unfounded charges of police brutality were a classic example of the communist technique to destroy the public confidence in the police and when you destroy the symbol of authority and of the laws, you bring about anarchy. J. Edgar Hoover also warned, if we destroy the integrity, the effectiveness of our local law enforcement agencies, Whence do we turn for protection from the evil forces which stand ever ready to devour us? Our nation depends on the sanctity of its local police agencies. We cannot afford their destruction, their weakening through unreal, unfounded charges. It is obvious that unarmed policemen could be of very limited help in protecting the citizen and his family from those who live outside the law. But Howard Moore an official of the American Civil Liberties Union and also general counsel for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a group always in the forefront among the advocates of so-called civil disobedience, has demanded the disarming of all local police. Others exert their efforts on seemingly less radical programs, such as pushing for the establishment of civilian police review boards, supposedly objective outside agencies to pass judgment on complaints against the police. They argue people would have more confidence if an outside agency conducted police brutality hearings. But the experience of Rochester, New York, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, two cities who have police review boards, indicates this is not so. Their experience has shown that these boards have done little or nothing to reduce the hostility toward police. For both places have seen rioting in the streets since the establishment of review boards. There is another side to the police review board issue, and it has very serious implications. George Putnam, 
the noted TV commentator, puts it this way. Let's face it. The deadening of police effectiveness is an essential part of the communist dogma. Attempts to superimpose over the police departments of our nation such police review boards would, in effect, put a bounty on each police officer's head and would make him a target of irresponsible complaints. Chicago Police Superintendent Wilson, when asked if a civilian review board in cases where police brutality is charged would be of benefit, replied, quote, I think it would destroy discipline in the Chicago Police Department if we had one, end quote. And most law enforcement authorities agree that civilian review boards do destroy discipline, morale, and police dignity. In defense against the rising cries of police brutality, most major police departments have set up special internal branches whose principal responsibility is to investigate all complaints against the police. Investigations by these special branches are very thorough, and if a charge of misconduct is substantiated, the department is far from lenient with the offending officer. Mr. W. Cleon Skousen, former FBI official and police chief of Salt Lake City, is one of America's foremost authorities on police procedures. He has on many occasions exposed the false claim that the citizen has no recourse against an offending police officer. Mr. Skousen points out that any private citizen may go to the local chief of police, the local city council, or the mayor with his complaint of misconduct. He can even file criminal charges against the officer or officers involved with the city attorney, the local district attorney, or the U.S. Department of Justice attorney. If none of these give satisfactory results, he can go to the local grand jury or directly to the FBI with his charges. While an impartial review of the facts clearly show that police brutality charges are generally unfounded and that every citizen has adequate means to ensure that his complaint is properly dealt with, the facts seem to support the contention that people brutality against the police officer is a real and fast-growing problem. Since 1960, the number of policemen murdered annually in the line of duty has doubled, and one out of every ten policemen in the country is assaulted every year. In an attempt to put a halt to this intolerable rise in violence against police officers, in California, the crime of battery against a police officer was recently changed from a misdemeanor to a felony offense. In the first five months after the penalty was increased, 129 persons were arrested for actual physical assault and battery of policemen. Local law enforcement agencies in most communities are undermanned and urgently need additional personnel to provide the citizen and his property the protection to which he is entitled. Although the men and women who serve in our nation's local law enforcement agencies are daily subjected to increasing physical threats and verbal abuse, they continue to man the front line of our protection, and their high standards and record of dedication is outstanding. This recent City of Los Angeles report disclosed that in 1964, of the 4,816 applicants for the position of policeman, only 309 men and 16 women could meet the high mental, moral, psychological, and physical requirements necessary to graduate from the police academy. Typical of their high caliber is the Los Angeles officer who, in April of 1965, disregarded his own personal safety to enter an apartment building which was engulfed in flames. Forced to his hands and knees by intense heat and flame, the officer rescued a woman and her baby. Then he returned three more times to make certain all the occupants were safe. Such police officers do not expect any special reward for their actions for protecting their fellow citizens' life and property is their chosen task. But the increasing attacks on the integrity of local police agencies are making it more difficult to find enough citizens of this high caliber who are willing to serve in our nation's local law enforcement agencies. If this trend continues, local police agencies will not have a sufficient number of police officers to curb the rise of crime and violence in our country, and total anarchy will be the eventual result. The question is, what can be done to stem this national crime wave? A demand for more police is heard everywhere. Some call for better trained police, or even suggest the establishment of a national police force directed from Washington, D.C., 
by yet another swarm of unelected, politically appointed bureaucrats. But the solution to our national crime problem lies deeper, and the final answer is not to be found in more police, better trained police, or even in better courts. The deadly and paralyzing attitude of public apathy and indifference must change, and more Americans must take an active interest and part in ensuring the preservation of this great nation. Moral values must be strengthened, and respect for the rights and property of others must be reestablished. It is also vitally important that further deterioration in family life be combated, for as Police Inspector Taylor of New York City observed, there seems to be, increasingly, a lack of parental supervision. There's a chain reaction. Disrespect for parents results in disrespect for policemen and the law generally. That disrespect often turns into actual enmity. All peaceful, law-abiding citizens must unite in demanding respect for our nation's laws and insist that our elected representatives fulfill their principal duty, the protecting of people against lawless invasions of persons and property. All citizens should be urged to show their belief in and their support of our local police and to insist that these local law enforcement agencies remain established, supported, and controlled at the community level. Each of us can do our part by reaffirming and displaying in our everyday lives our belief in the fundamental right to life, liberty, and property for every American, regardless of his race, color, or creed. For when the rights of every man are secure, men and women of goodwill can work toward resolving the issues that divide us in the orderly fashion of a civilized society. And the people of our great nation live together in peace and harmony, free to enjoy the enormous bounty of individual freedom and property that God has bestowed upon us.